Ah yes, the wonderful world of FMV adventure games. Interactive movies, whatever you want to call them. In the mid-90s, these titles dominated the adventure gaming market. Most of them were utter garbage, but some stood out and have withstood the test of time. Some because they're actually good, and others because they're so outrageous that we can't help but remember them. Stuff like Gabriel Knight 2, The Seventh Guest, Tex Murphy, and many more. One that's sort of on the edge of being forgotten is Ripper, which is a murder mystery starring Christopher Walken as a hard-boiled detective. The wheels of justice may grind slowly, but they're moving. They're moving. How is this game so often left off of lists and retrospectives? Aside from the man, the myth, the legend, Christopher Cowbell Walken, I gotta have more cowbell. Ripper also features John Reese davies Burgess Meredith, Karen Allen, David Patrick Kelly, Paul Giamatti, are you kidding me? Every single actor, big or small, shines in this one. So let's dive in to the Christopher Walken detective adventure, Ripper. Ripper is a first-person point-and-click FMV adventure developed by Take-Two Interactive. Released in 1996, it was also the first game to feature the incomparable Christopher Walken. And yes, I said first. Christopher Walken made another live-action video game appearance later the same year in Privateer 2, The Darkening. He would also lend his voice to True Crime, Streets of LA, and True Crime, New York City in the early 2000s. But it's here, in Ripper, where Walken really stretches his legs as the callous and unscrupulous Detective Vincent Magnata. How's the coffee, Sarge? Mm, nice and hot. Guys got balls so big they collect the gum on the floor. But you, as the player, actually take control of Jake Quinlan, played by Scott Cohen, not Christopher Walken's Magnata. Fuck! But Jake is a pretty good character in his own right, and Scott Cohen is a likable actor. He gives Jake a smart-ass attitude that keeps him interesting to watch. I liked a lot of the banter that he had with other characters in the story. Jake Quinlan is no Gabriel Knight, but he's good. And as much fun as it probably would have been to take control of the manic Christopher Walken, I think interacting with him throughout the game is the more entertaining approach. This guy is unfucking believable Jake Quinlan is a reporter for the Virtual Herald, one of the top newspapers in New York City in the year 2040. Jake works on the crime beat, and though he isn't a police detective, he does have a certain authoritative air about him, and will throw his weight around from time to time, threatening and blackmailing people to get what he wants. Along with his assistant, Catherine Powell, played by Tawny Welch, Jake is on the trail of a serial killer who has given himself the name The Ripper a direct reference to Jack the Ripper, the infamously unapprehended Whitechapel murderer of the late 1800s. The Ripper's M.O. bears resemblances to that of the original Jack the Ripper's. The victim's bodies have been mutilated by a very skilled knife handler. Or at least, that's what the investigators believe at first. Since the Ripper murders began, Jake has been receiving messages from the killer. Again, directly referencing the letters received by police during the original Jack the Ripper murders. The first two of the Ripper's attacks occurred before the start of the game, and the intro cinematic here shows the third murder. Whoa, 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 okay, so obviously can't play that on YouTube, but can you believe this game came out four years before the cowbell sketch on Saturday Night Live? You're gonna want that cowbell! Did the SNL writers play this game or something? That is a crazy coincidence. Uh, anyway, the Ripper's latest victim is Renee Stein, a book editor at Knopf. We gain control of Jake as he arrives at the crime scene, where we can speak to police photographer Carl Stasiak, played by Richard Bright, who's quite shaken up by the brutality of the murders. Cold Carl Stasiak. We gotta stop meeting like this. Carl! <sighs> Sorry, Quinlan. What'd you say? Yo, sick medallion, bro. Is there any difference between this murder and the previous ones? It was identical. Absolutely identical. It was a precision cut. A perfect line. And the way he empties out the body cavity. The way the organs are blown all around the room. So it's the same killer? Oh, for sure. I mean, the organs, they're completely cut to pieces. I've never seen anything like this in my life. It's amazing. When it clues to how it's done? Don't ask me. You think I'd be used to seeing things like this by now, but I'm not. Whoever did this is beyond madness. It's pure evil. 
We can also speak to Walken's Vincent Magnata, who is just a peach. Same MO as the others? You got it. Look around you, asshole. If anything, this is more gruesome than the other two. Hell of a lot more splatter. Magnata insists there's no direct connection between the three current victims. No sign of forced entry, no unidentified fingerprints in the apartment, and no one who saw anything or anyone suspicious in the area. Jake also notices that the computer in the room is on, and Renee was decked into the library node in cyberspace at the time of the murder. Magnata shuffles Jake out of the crime scene, but not before breaking some evidence. Well, you shouldn't be touching anything, should you, Magnata? Hmm. I guess this case has me rattled. Jake scans the broken mug into his small, handheld computer called a WAC. I don't think they ever explain what WAC stands for in-game, and the manual doesn't say anything either. WACs are ubiquitous throughout the world of Ripper. For in-game purposes, it acts as a database for clues, a notebook, and a communicator. The last function we see demonstrated immediately as Jake gets a call from his assistant, Catherine. Listen, Jake, something's come up here. Something about the Ripper? Might be nothing. I don't know. It could be something big. Just wait for me at the newsroom and I'll let you know as soon as I find out. Now talk to me. What's going on? I have to go. Trust me. Th who's in charge here? Well, after last night, I'd say that I am. Oh yeah, Jake and Catherine are also banging. Naturally. Back in the newsroom, Jake runs into his editor, Ben Dodds, played by Ossie Davis. Something about the delivery here is so laid back and cozy. I love talking to him throughout the game. What's going on, Ben? Did Catherine get a break in the Ripper story? I don't know, Jake. I thought you were the lead reporter in the story. Well, so did I. Do you know what she's up to? She's your assistant. You tell me. But for a news editor, Ben, you sure don't know much. Afterwards, Jake sits down to write. Catherine and I met on the job. Despite reminding myself that mixing love and work can get messy, it didn't take long for it to become more than a professional relationship. Probably shouldn't publish that one. Also, nice typing technique. Jake gets another call in his whack, this time from the Ripper. Dear boss. Have you seen my work this morning yet? Your stories make the cops seem so confident. I couldn't find out who did the voice for the Ripper, but it sounds a lot like John Reese davies Catherine. Quinlan. Where are you going? Quinlan. Quinlan. Usually it takes an hour to cross that part of Manhattan. I did it in 20 minutes, propelled by kicking myself in the ass for letting Catherine go out alone. I was scared as hell when I got there, but... Everything looked okay in her apartment. Until Catherine showed up, that is. Catherine, what is going on here? Catherine, what, what is it? What the f what is wrong? Ca what happened? <laughs> what? No, 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 Catherine! Catherine! No! Catherine! Oh, fuck! Catherine! Please, Catherine! Fuck! Catherine survives her Ripper encounter, but winds up in a coma at the Tribeca Center Hospital. Jake is now more invested in the Ripper case than ever, and we got a game on our hands. As you investigate the Ripper case, you'll mostly be talking to other characters and poking around both real-world and virtual environments. As expected from what is essentially an interactive movie, speaking to characters is what will take up most of the playtime. You have dialogue options and conversations, but for the most part, you'll just be running through all of them. There are no options that lead to branching paths or anything like that. Things are pretty linear. Most of the evidence that you collect in your investigation will be transmitted to your whack. For example, the pieces of the broken mug Jake collected earlier are virtually reconstructed, creating a simple puzzle where you need to fit the pieces back together to find a clue. Puzzles aren't inventory-based like a lot of other adventure games. In Ripper, they're more focused on cryptology and numerology, as well as just listening to conversations for clues. Some of the puzzles are real head-scratchers, requiring pattern recognition and careful attention to detail just to figure out where to even begin with them. You can adjust the difficulty of the puzzles when you start the game, which will alter their solutions. I played on medium for my playthrough. The puzzle solving overall was pretty good. I got a few nice aha moments out of some of them, and there's a good variety to them, which kept things fresh throughout. Beyond puzzles, Ripper also has ugh, action sequences. Here they take the form of first-person shooting galleries, and these are mostly regulated to cyberspace. The world of Ripper features VR decks that people use to access the web. Inside are places that the game refers to as wells. These cyberspace wells are basically interactive websites. There are libraries, game servers, personal domains, and Ripper really goes over the top with its depiction of its virtual world. So prepare yourself for some glorious mid-90s 3D renders. 
Some of these wells are protected by intrusion counter electronics, ICE for short, a term coined by the great William Gibson in his seminal work of cyberpunk fiction, the 1981 novel Neuromancer. And the term has been co-opted by pretty much every cyberpunk narrative since then. The ICE in Ripper take the form of various characters, creatures, and other such enemies that will need to be shot down in first-person on-rail shooting style segments. Unfortunately, adventure games rarely do action well, and Ripper is no exception. You can adjust the difficulty of combat and the options, but no matter the level, they're not great. Not completely terrible, but I could have done without them. Luckily, they're very forgiving if you fail them. You start right back at the beginning of the sequence, no need to load a save or anything. There are also a few ice segments that are just puzzles. Those ones are better. The gameplay in Ripper is standard for the genre. Well thought out mostly, but nothing that blew me away. The real draw here are the story sequences. Not because the story is really all that great, but because of the acting. Everyone looked like they were having a blast. As I mentioned, I liked Scott Cohen as Jake. Christopher Walken is just Christopher Walkening it up in every scene. Paul Giamatti is perfect as the hospital lab technician. And Karen Allen is so endearingly annoying as the head doctor of the medical center. But I got the most enjoyment out of the side characters. And I'm not even talking about the ones who are directly connected to the investigation. I mean the incidental characters who you only talk to like once or twice throughout the whole game. The receptionist at the front desk of the Tribeca Center Hospital, played by Kira Arn, is amazing. She gets so into the performance. Medica, hold on. May I help you off with something? Beg your pardon? I said, can I help you? What'd you think I said? Uh, nothing. I... <laughs> I'm looking for uh, whoever's taking care of my girlfriend, Catherine Powell. That would be Dr. Burton. Take the elevator to the second floor and make a right. If she's not there, go to ICU down the hall from there. Whatever you do, don't stand too close to her. <laughs> Why is that? A little chilly. Then there's the forensic pathologist, played by William Seymour. Where, where is this storage area? Oh, you just go through the door in the back of the morgue. But... Oh, shit! Do -do -do. Mr. Quinlan. Please leave before you get me fired. David Thornton as Twig, this burnout hacker dude. What's with the shadow? Like him? He's a movement model for a sea space doppelganger I'm developing. If it all works out, he'll give me true multitasking capability. This is just practice, of course. The real thing will be in cyberspace. Excuse me. Sensors itch. But my favorite has to be the bartender, played by Dan Moran. How about a beer? Yeah, sure thing. Why don't you try this one? It's called Viper Pills. Goes down real smooth. It's got some bite. On the house. <laughs> Look at that pour. I love it. It's a great cast. The acting isn't good, but the scenery-chewing delivery from a lot of the actors make the whole thing endlessly entertaining. It feels like a schlocky film you'd find on the sci-fi channel circa the mid to late 90s, right around that Saturday anime era. You're watching Saturday anime on the sci-fi channel. The only thing that kind of sucks is moving in between these moments. Scene transitions are agonizingly long, and there's no way to skip them. Despite being hot on the trail of a serial killer and worrying about his girlfriend who's in a coma, Jake just strolls around places, taking in the scenery. You can almost imagine him whistling, just taking his sweet ass time. There's a lot of backtracking in Ripper too, so you'll be seeing these moments a lot. I guess the devs were really proud of their 3D environments. The music also isn't all that memorable. It does its job and stays in the background. There's nothing to really highlight, it's just there. As for the structure of the game, talking to people and reading various documents will open up new locations, and you'll be able to move freely around the city via a world map. By the end of the game, you'll have a list of about a dozen places open to explore. However, Ripper comes on six CD-ROMs to fit all of the FMV sequences, and moving between certain locations will require you to swap discs. Now, unless you have an older computer capable of running the CD-ROMs directly, you'll most likely be using a bundled file with DOSBox. I got mine from the collection chamber, which I always like to shout 
shout out for old abandoned games like this one whenever I find them on there. The bundling is convenient because whenever the swap disk message comes up, all you need to do is hit continue to advance. I ran into several issues with the game crashing in some of these instances though, and this made my playthrough more difficult than it needed to be, as I had to kind of map out different paths through the game to avoid crashes. There are other sites that have Ripper packaged this way, like Zom's Lair, but I ran into the same issue with that file too. It may just be my machine, so your mileage may vary if you decide to try out Ripper for yourself. I guess this is what I get for not having a mid-90s PC build lying around to run this game properly. Back to the story, Jake heads to the police station to get more info on the case. I know I've said this almost every time a new character has been introduced, but Steven Randazzo as Sergeant Lou Brandon is amazing. I'll tell you, Lou, Magnata wasn't all two together at the murder site. It's lucky for you. No, I'm serious. There was this one strange thing. Strange? Yeah, I mean, if I didn't know any better, I'd say that he intentionally destroyed a piece of evidence. It won't be the first time. Well, he's done it before? Yeah, he hides it, he destroys it, he withholds it, you name it. And this is common knowledge? Yeah, he's like king shit at a bounty collecting and the chief gets a piece of it. I mean, what are you gonna do? You know how this place works. This bounty thing has been brought up before. In the world of Ripper, police collect bounties on the criminals that they apprehend. I'm sure you can imagine how terrifyingly corrupt a system like that could be. Also, Lou's got that same sick medallion as Stasiak. Must be a pig thing. <coughs> Speaking of Stasiak, he's bugged out to Wyoming, which is a bit suspicious, to say the least. Next up is a visit to the evidence locker, where Jake seems to have some dirt on the clerk there, Warren Spankowski, played by John Ventignilia. Oh, Christ. What do you want? Some respect, Spankowski. You know, you really shouldn't talk to me like that. I shouldn't be talking to you at all, you goddamn leech. What do you want? Some of us gotta work for a living. Right. <clears throat> I need the evidence in the Powell case. No way, Quinlan. That could be my job. <sighs> spanky, Spanky, Spanky. I own you. I'm you're just gonna have to learn to live with it. Or, do you prefer I go down to the DA's office and tell them about a little evidence selling incident? Jesus Christ, Quinlan, how long is this going to go on, huh? For the rest of your life. When I'm 80 years old, I'm going to come in here and tell you to shine my shoes, and you're going to jump and do it, asshole. So why don't you just go and get the evidence in the Powell case and be quick about it, or I'm going to make you kiss my ass. You stop moving like a fucking turtle? God damn, Quinlan. Anyway, turns out Renee Stein's whack is missing from the evidence box, and Spankowski says Magnata took it home with him. Heading over to Magnata's office, there are documents laid out on the desk about another murder case, a man named Hamilton Wofford killed in his own home. There's an arrest report signed by Magnata, and that signature of his is going to be useful later on. Magnata's not keen on giving Jake any information. However, Hamilton Wofford, the victim in the police report on Magnata's desk, was a cyber architect, and Jake believes there may be some connection to the Ripper case. Jake also learns that Magnata was the one who decided where to send Catherine for treatment after her narrow escape from the Ripper's attack. When Jake confronts Magnata about stealing Renee's whack from the crime scene, Magnata brushes it off. Are you aware that there's evidence missing in the Powell case? What the hell are you talking about? There's no evidence missing. Well, Catherine's whack, for example. Spankowski says you have it. Well, then it's not missing, is it? Worry about your own business. Leave the police work to me. It's really hard not to just play every single dialogue exchange, especially the ones with Walken. You're lucky I'm in a good mood today, Conan, because you come this close to finding out what it's like to be a human shish kebab rotating in one of our fine penal institutions. Anyway, Magnata had Catherine sent to the Tribeca Center Hospital's Metacognition Center, METCOG for short, and there Jake meets Dr. Claire Burton, played by Karen Allen. He also meets a couple of lab technicians, one of whom, Dr. Bud Cable, played by Paul Giamatti, is concerned that Burton isn't doing everything she can to help Catherine awaken from her coma. You see, in the world of Ripper, people's brains can be directly interfaced with through cyberspace. The doctors have managed to pull out a blurry image of the Ripper from Catherine's psyche, but in order to get a clearer picture, they'll need to feed Catherine more information about the case to awaken her dormant memories. There are experts called data angels who specialize in these kinds of tasks, but Burton hasn't called in her usual expert on this case, which the other doctors find peculiar. While at the hospital, Jake takes a trip to the morgue to visit forensic pathologist Vic Farley, played by Peter Boyden, who's another amazing character. They working you hard? Mm. Working me like crazy these days. 
Hey, is this Renee Stein? You kidding? You were at the crime scene. You saw her inside splattered everywhere. Yeah, I guess I did. Yeah, but this woman was married to her ripper. Yeah, this was a businessman away on a trip for three weeks. He gets paranoid that his partner's putting it to her while he's gone, so he flies home early and shoots it at that. I mean, stuff like that. That's why I never got married, you know? Vic informs Jake that Dr. Burton's usual data angel expert is a guy named Joey Falconetti, cyberspace handle Falcon Eddy. In order to track down the Falcon, he suggests Jake visit Gambit Nelson, an old school hacker who hangs out at a local bar. He passes the time at the Cafe du Champ. Du Champ, Vic. Du Champ. Well, you can find him there. This Duchamp, Duchamp bit is a running joke throughout the game with a couple of other characters. It's a simple thing, but I really liked it. At the Café Duchamp, Gambit reveals that he and Falconetti owned a company together in the past. Nowadays, Falconetti spends his time mostly in cyberspace, but his body is around, and there's a guy named Twig, who lives out in Hoboken, who knows where to find Falconetti in the flesh. Heading out to Hoboken, a trip no one ever wants to take, Jake finds Twig, who doesn't want to give up Falconetti's real location. But all it takes is Jake getting a bit handsy, and he crumbles like a crouton. You don't give me Falconetti in five seconds. I'm going to email your address to Detective Magnata, and you won't be dancing with any shadows in a maximum security prison. Don't blow your motherboard, because Burton's getting lazy. That's her problem, not mine. Falcon is playing in one of his wells. The address is Circus Maximus. I'd suggest trying a different approach with him if you're planning on cooperation. Thanks. You've been a big help. Before heading into cyberspace to meet up with Falcon Eddie, there are a few other leads to run down. The virtual library is the last place Renee Stein was decked into, and she was checking out a book on Jack the Ripper. A puzzle in Catherine's apartment will give Jake the password to Catherine's notes on the Ripper case. However, her notes are decrypted. They can be deciphered, but it takes some time, as in most of the rest of the game. The notes will give you clues on where to go and who to talk to, as well as several hints for certain puzzles later in the playthrough. Also, by checking the Rolodex on Catherine's desk in the newsroom, which, I mean, it's the year 2040 and they're still using Rolodexes, really? But anyway, checking it gives Jake the location of Soap's Smokehouse, where he meets the proprietor, Soap Beatty, played by Jimmy Walker, JJ from Good Times. Dynamite. Soap is a contact of Catherine's who not only owns a smoke shop, but also acts as a hacker and handwriting analysis expert, among other things. Useful skills that Jake will need to make use of later on. Hey. In the net, everything is in link, Quinlan. The shop is the shop. In cyberspace, I can walk. I can run. I can fucking dance, baby. Jake can also go to the Wofford Cottage and speak to Covington, the twin brother of Hamilton Wofford, the cyber architect who was recently murdered. By investigating the cottage, Jake discovers that Hamilton was working on a virtual recreation of Whitechapel, the district of London where the original Jack the Ripper murders took place curious. Finally, Jake heads to the Circus Maximus well in cyberspace and lands himself in a trap constructed by Falcon Eddie. <laughs> Looking for Falcon Eddie? Well, I think you got him. What the fuck is going on here? It's a 40 gigabyte virtual environment. <laughs> Made it myself. Whole 40 gigs? My god. This reminds me of that line in Neuromancer when Case is talking about trying to sell three megabytes of hot RAM on the black market. I have a friend who was attacked by the Ripper. The Ripper? Someone who's almost as good with knives as I am. She needs your help. Before I help you, you gotta show me what you're worth in cyberspace. I'm gonna work with you, I gotta know you can handle yourself. So Jake has to beat Falcon Eddie's score in this on-rail shooting gallery. After that, he agrees to work with him. Back at Falcon Eddie's safe house, Twig tells Jake that Falcon Eddie has been in the room behind him the whole time. Yeah, that's the face I made when he said that too. Falcon Eddie reveals that he has a grudge with Magnata and that Dr. Burton over at the hospital has the hots for him according to him. Jake persuades Falconetti to help him interface with Catherine by saying that he could piss off Magnata in the process by tampering with his investigation. And this seems to do the trick. At this point, we're on to act two out of three. So this is a pretty good spot to break for spoilers. If you'd like to experience Ripper on your own, skip to this time to get my final thoughts. 
The game gives you freedom on what order you visit a lot of locations throughout the first two acts, but this part of the story is always the same. The third act is where things get shaken up a bit, since there are four suspects who could potentially be the Ripper, and some puzzle solutions and story sequences change slightly depending on what path you're on. So, if you're ready, let's keep going. Arriving back at the hospital, Jake finds Falconetti and Burton arguing. Burton doesn't want to let Falconetti deck into Catherine's consciousness. Is your method dangerous? <laughs> what, are you kidding? Of course it's dangerous. We're not talking about accounting databases here. Decking into an organism's a lot harder than linking into a machine. You can't be overriding shit. You gotta watch where you're digging around. Emotions, memories, potentially very damaging. It's worth the risk, though. Well, how do you figure? I can rebuild her memory. I can make that image so real, you'll think it's breathing. You'll be able to stare the killer right in the eye. Well, that would save Catherine and anybody else the Ripper had on his list. I mean, what's the real reason for preventing Falconetti from doing this, Burton? Do I detect a little magnata in the reporter's line of questioning? Do any damn thing you want. I'm going to the gym. The gym? Uh, okay. So with Falconetti's help, Jake fights his way through the defenses in Catherine's brain and finds what Falconetti calls her essence. Jake needs to give more information about the case to get Catherine to remember more and form a clearer picture of the Ripper. Currently, he doesn't have any new details to give her, but he has access, so decking into Catherine and feeding her information will be a recurring thing from now on. Jake goes down to the morgue to see Farley again, but finds out that he's been fired and replaced by a new pathologist. Bob Epples, who's not as forthcoming with information as Farley was. Where is Farley? I have no idea where Mr. Farley is. But from what I've heard about him, I suggest you look for him in a restaurant. One that specializes in fatty cuisine. <laughs> Dude to do. Dude to do? <laughs> Why? That's amazing. Anyway, the reason Epples heard Farley was fired was because of his smoking. Didn't keep the morgue clean enough. Which, I mean, yeah, I could see that being a problem. Over at the police station, Magnata is bullying the desk sergeant. Here's my stuff. I'm going into interrogation, Brandon. You know, little police work. How's the coffee, Sarge? Mm, nice and hot. Jesus Christ. This serendipitous moment allows Jake to steal Magnata's ID and use it to access the detective's personnel file, which gives us a password we'll make use of later. We can also take a peek at Magnata's interrogation technique. Enough, okay? I sold those fossils some lucid B. Not my fault they had blowouts. I mean, what are you making a big deal out of this for? It's not like they weren't ready for the big sleep. It's touching to see you feel so deeply. They say underneath the skin of every junkie runs the blood of a poet. I wouldn't know. I'm just a cop who loves his job. No performance now, mother. I'm in rehearsal. If we check back on the decryption progress of Catherine's notes, Jake finds out that she has some information hidden in a couple of books in her apartment. Heading over there and solving a puzzle in one of the books reveals a disc with a code saved on it. Entering the string of numbers into the calculator on Catherine's desk in the newsroom reveals a secret compartment containing a listening device and a camera. Jake plants the listening device in Magnata's office on one of his cigars. Magnata will never even notice the bug is there. You sure about that, Jake? That looks awfully suspicious. And Magnata's a pretty heavy cigar smoker. What happens if he smokes that one? But, you know, I don't know. I, I'm, I'm not the investigative reporter. At the hospital, Jake finds another card on the reception desk, and she doesn't care that he takes it. Turns out this card allows access to Burton's office. Jake takes the opportunity to place the camera he has inside the eye of an anatomy model. Well, that fits in there nicely. Snooping around some more, Jake finds a book signed by a university professor named Lillian Beck. He heads over to the university to speak with Professor Beck, and she spills the beans about Dr. Burton and Falconetti's past, as part of a gamer group called the Web Runners. This group that they started apparently still exists. Posts on a bulletin board in the hallway of the university provide clues on how to find and access the Web Runners loft. After entering the long ass code into the door, Jake enters the loft and finds one of the newer members inside. Hey, man, what the fuck? Where's the 7th Cavalry? Who are you, man? You almost gave me a stroke. I was doing the Custer Sim, and I was the only Korean Indian, and I had Goldilocks by the throat. This won't take too long, honey. I just need to ask you a few questions. Make an appointment with my secretary. I'm going to tell you what I've been going through lately. 
hop along. I've been playing tag with a serial killer and ruining my shine by walking through his victim's guts. My girlfriend's in a coma, and the next time the Ripper kills, it could possibly be yours truly. So fuck your cartoons! Yeah, Jake's a little high strung. He's under a lot of stress right now. This current web runner, Kashi, says that Magnata's name sounds familiar, but she's not 100% on that. Jake will need to access the web runner's well to get more information. After accessing the well by completing a slide puzzle, I guess that's fitting for a group of gamer nerds, but I was expecting something a bit more action-packed. Although considering the shooting gallery segments, I'll take the slide puzzle. But anyway, Jake finds an archive with dossiers on each of the founding members of the web runners. And what do you know? Magnata was one as well. My god, what a photo. Jake also learns that Burton, Falconetti, and Magnata were part of a love triangle. Burton and Falconetti were originally married, and apparently Magnata broke up their relationship by falsifying evidence in a murder case and framing Falconetti. Though he was released from prison after two years when it was found out that he was convicted on falsified evidence. Magnata was never fingered as the one who created this kerfuffle, though. There are files on other members as well, including the three original victims of the Ripper. Jake then gets a transmission from Stephanie Jordan, one of the runners who had a close relationship with Burton, Falconetti, and Magnata. She tells him she has information about the Ripper and to meet her at the Web Runner's loft. But when Jake arrives, he finds another brutal crime scene. Another web runner eats it at the hands of the Ripper, and Magnata has already had the body removed. Jake also finds Kashi, who was decked in during the attack and has no idea what happened. The cops just took the body. God, it was a terrible man. I was all decked in, and I was doing the OK Corral, and I was shooting the hell out of the Clintons, and I killed all of this. That stuff hit me, and dude, I'm not even thinking about it, because I figure it's... Doc Holiday blowing Frank McCloud reopen. Harry's still alive and shooting Morgan, so I know something's wrong. So I, I, I pause the program and take my goggles off. And she was just there, dude. She was just all cut up with her eyes open and looking at me. And fuck, I didn't do this shit, man. I didn't even see anybody leaving. Poor Kashi. Jake goes to the morgue to check on the body, but Bob Epples has no idea what he's talking about, and mentions that he's been locked out of the computer in the lab. After a bit of a runaround to figure out how to fix the computer, Jake and Bob access the files and find out that Stephanie Jordan's body has been placed in the animal storage room. Where, where is this storage area? Oh, well, you just go through the door in the back of the morgue. But... Oh, shit! Do -do -do. Mr. Quinlan, please leave before you get me fired. I love this guy. There's another door inside animal storage, but it's locked by voice command. And this begins a pretty interesting puzzle. Jake needs to splice together an audio recording of Burton's voice to unlock the door. So he signs out an audio editing program from the library in cyberspace, and then visits Burton at the gym where he records her speaking. We also learn that Burton likes to run the Victorian London course on the treadmill, because of course she does. Anyway, after getting the recording, it needs to be rearranged so she says, this is Dr. Burton, open up. This is Dr. Burton, open up. I liked this whole thing, probably one of the best puzzles in the game. The door reveals a whole secret lab that Dr. Burton has been keeping, and the body of Stephanie Jordan is indeed in here. Burton has also been conducting experiments on monkeys. You can even talk to one. She can kill others like me without touching me, Diver. Space. Brain. Burton keeps her lips sealed about the lab, and through Catherine's notes, Jake finds out that Falconetti has a secret well in cyberspace, which contains notes about the Ripper murders and copies of the original letters from Jack the Ripper. Confronting Falconetti about this leads to a conversation about his wedding with Burton and the animosity between him and Magnata. When Jake mentions Stephanie's murder, Falconetti initially says he doesn't know who she is, but when Jake reminds him that she was one of the founding members of the Web Runners, his memory is suddenly jogged. At this point, it's pretty clear that that Burton, Falconetti, and Magnata are all prime suspects. They're all doing many overtly suspicious things that could lead you to believe that any one of them could be the Ripper. Meanwhile, Jake keeps feeding Catherine details about his investigation. Once she's been told enough, you'll eventually get a whack transmission from Vic Farley, the original pathologist that was fired from the hospital. He tells Jake to meet him at the Café du Champ. Vic has discovered how the Ripper is killing his victims and leaving behind no physical evidence. All of the victims were killed while decked 
hacked into cyberspace, and the Ripper has developed a code that's like a self-destruct sequence. It increases the body's internal pressure until the organs explode. And at that moment... Vic! Vic! Oh my god! Vic! Fuck! Oh god! Talk about spilling your guts, am I right? <laughs> yeah. From here on out, the game can change ever so slightly depending on which suspect the game has decided is the actual Ripper. And when I say ever so slightly, I really mean it. There's not a whole lot that actually changes. And I'll come back to talking more about this at the end. Jake is arrested for Farley's murder and gets interrogated by Magnata in an insane scene. I want to know how you did it. How you killed them. What are you high on, Magnata? I want to know how you oh. did it. <sighs> ah, shit! <laughs> Fucking have your badge for this. I know all about pressure points. The pain's exquisite. Don't leave a mark. Not that I give a damn, whether I mark you up or not. Oh, oh, you are fucking losing it, Magnata. And when I run this story, everybody's gonna start thinking that you're the Ripper. You're the one getting mystery messages from the Ripper. You're the one. With Powell when she's attacked. You're the last person Stephanie Jordan contacts. You're with Farley when he's killed. How come the Ripper communicates only with you? I'm a writer, asshole. If you ask me, it looks like the Ripper's a sick fuck of a muckraker who can't tell the difference between a pen and a blade. Didn't this sink in when I told you that before Farley was killed, he told me that the weapon is in cyberspace. That means that the killer could rip you apart and be sipping coffee in a cafe a thousand miles away. You dirty. <laughs> ah, shit! How are you going to explain this, Magnata? Huh? <laughs> Self-defense, man. I mean, why'd you hit me, Quinlan? What are you, stupid? Hitting a cop? I'm gonna smear you all over the front page tomorrow, you sick fucking bastard. Now let me out of here. You got nothing on me, or you'd arrest me by now. You could walk. For now. But I'm on to you. you Wait, me? so he's just gonna let him walk after all that? He cut his forehead for nothing? Crazy mother... Jake heads back to the Wofford cottage, hoping to find more clues, but instead he finds someone holding Covington hostage. Whoa, where did Jake get that gun? He shoots the intruder in the shoulder, and Jake figures this person was probably the Ripper, so now we're looking for someone with a shoulder wound, right? Catching up with Magnata again shows that he's got a problem with his shoulder. When Jake accuses Magnata of being the Ripper, Magnata says he's already caught the Ripper, and it's Falconetti. He has him in a cell. He even produces an image of Falconetti that he says came from Catherine's brainwave activity. Don't think any of these developments lets you off the hook. You're still on my list, Quinlan. What? But according to you, you already caught the Ripper. What the hell is going on? Earlier, Covington Wofford revealed that his brother's consciousness is still alive in cyberspace. So Jake decks in to speak with the dead Wofford. He tells Jake that the Ripper was one of his clients and commissioned him to build a replica of Whitechapel in cyberspace. The Ripper even helped him build it. So whoever they are, they're clearly a skilled cyber architect. Probably some kind of weirdo game developer. Wofford tells Jake that the Ripper appeared to him as a man and as a woman on different occasions. On the sly, Wofford developed a weapon that can kill the Ripper in cyberspace. And it takes the form of an energy shuriken. I shit you not. Wofford split the weapon into three parts and hid them in different wells. Jake needs to access the three wells and complete puzzles or combat to obtain all three. Easy. But the weapon won't be enough. Jake also needs a way to protect himself from the Ripper's attacks. If you head over to Falconetti's well, you can find a recording of him talking about developing a role-playing game based on Jack the Ripper. Also, one of the web runners was killed the last time they all played together. At the smoke shop, we can talk to Soap about Vic Farley's theory about how the Ripper kills. Jesus, biomorphing through the net? Using a C space code to control the body? I, I 
Guess it makes sense in theory. <laughs> really? Soap theorizes that the Ripper has figured out how to put a timer on the code he inserts into his victims' bodies. That's how Farley was able to be killed while not being decked into cyberspace. Back at the hospital, Jake shows the image of Falcon Eddie as the Ripper to Dr. Cable, who says it looks real and corroborates that the police were decked into Catherine's brain, so they could have produced such an image. Jake also fiddles with the EEG machine and finds out that Catherine's brainwave activity increases on the dates when the Ripper murders took place. So is Catherine a suspect now too? The evidence is just piling up in every direction. When Jake decks into Catherine, he has enough information to get her talking. The name George Rhodes comes up, which is a name we saw in Catherine's Rolodex earlier. We learn that Josie Dorset was the woman who was killed in the Jack the Ripper game, and this was Catherine's mother. Catherine also admits to wanting to steal the Ripper's story from Jake to make her big break as a news reporter. However, the Ripper tricked her into signing out a Jack the Ripper book from the virtual library that transported her to the Whitechapel replica where she was attacked. While following this lead to the bank where George Rhodes works and to Berman Industries where there's information about who's bankrolling Burton's secret lab, a transmission comes through from the listening device in Magnata's office. I don't know how there's video of this as well. Maybe Burton dragged along that anatomy model? And yeah, I told you Magnata was going to smoke that cigar with the listening device on it. There's a lot more running around, tracking leads. I mean, I don't know how you all feel, but writing down this summary and speaking it out loud right now makes most of these plot points seem so random. There are so many details and overcomplications. My head is spinning. Eventually, all of this leads Jake to Kane's well, who reveals how Jake can protect himself from the Ripper. He'll need an antiviral utility, a compression program, and a sensor. Kane hands over the compression program and tells Jake that he can find the sensor in the ISIS well. He'll need more time to figure out where the antiviral is. After answering a Sphinx's riddle, Jake gets the sensor program. And in that short time, Kane has found the antiviral well, where you need to jump across these tiles to get to the other side and be given the utility. So now Jake has his weapon and protection from the Ripper, but he needs access to the Ripper role-playing game. At Duchamp's, he asks Gambit about it, who tells him games are archived in warp space, and Vigo Haman has the password to access that well. Here, we finally meet John Rhys Davies, who plays this one-off character, who wants to fuck Jake, apparently. Now, let me tell you how you fuck me, and how I'm going to. He's the bigwig behind the bankrolling of Burton's secret lab, but I had an interesting thought while speaking to him. As I pointed out earlier, it sounds like John Reese davies voices the Ripper, so I thought this was like a twist when I first experienced it. Like, you think up until this point that one of these other four characters you've been following around throughout the game is the Ripper, and then this guy comes out of nowhere and it's him, but... Yeah, no. Anyway, he coughs up the warp space password, but the game has been taken offline. So as if the appearance and misdirection of John Reese davies here wasn't enough of a letdown, turns out this whole pathway is just a complete waste of time. But it's a trigger that needs to be activated to continue the story. Back at the hospital once again, Jake discusses the Ripper game with Burton. She thinks the killer thought Josie Dorset, Catherine's mother, was actually Burton. She and Josie had switched parts right before the game began. When Jake asks her about the secret lab, she says that her research involved translating brain images in audiovisual output. The bank wanted the program so they could implant subliminal messages into people while they were decked into cyberspace, and Burton hints that there could be other applications for this. Maybe implanting a ticking time bomb into other people's bodies? But Burton also reveals that someone broke into her research notes, and if they were skilled enough, could replicate the program. When Jake tells her about the Ripper's method of implanting code into people's bodies, she suggests that maybe the the reason Catherine survived the attack is that the Ripper hadn't perfected the code for the remote transmission yet, but by the time Jake met up with Farley, they had. Jake then shows her the image of Falconetti as the Ripper and expresses his doubts as to its authenticity. And she says, yo dummy, you work for a newspaper. Don't they have stuff over there that can verify if an image has been doctored? And Jake's like, oh yeah. So yes, the Virtual Herald does indeed have a machine like that. And it turns out that the image has been doctored. Who to thunk it? When Jake confronts Magnata about the fake image, Jake's actor seems to be doing a bit of a Christopher Walken impression right to the man's right. face. Well, if it's another frame job, I'm gonna have to run it in the Herald. No, please don't. Not the Herald. That's cute, cute. You're gonna need all that cute stuff when I run my story. Because with no badge and no bounty, you're gonna need something. A front page story is probably gonna free Eddie. It's gonna cost you a shot at the Ripper bounty and probably 
bust through your badge. You can also confront Falcon Eddie at his safe house, and he, of course, has a sore shoulder as well, but he says he pulled it throwing knives. After you've confronted all three suspects, Dr. Cable will call to tell Jake that Catherine has produced a clear image of the Ripper. Jake rushes to the hospital, but by the time he arrives, they've lost the image. We almost had it, and the screen went static. It's off the monitor, it's out of memory, it's probably gone forever. Burton stacked into the net, I can't reach her. Something's seriously wrong, Quinlan. It's gotta be the Ripper, he's making his move. I am making my move. <laughs> the Ripper says to go to the library and use the Jack the Ripper book to enter the game. Once Jake enters, he runs into a fortune teller on the streets and you need to arrange these cards in order of the lyrics to the song I can't play in this video. I wonder why they use this song, actually. Is it because a Reaper sounds like Ripper? I don't know. After that, each of the suspects will appear before Jake. Now, after listening to this entire story synopsis, you may be wondering, okay, how do you know who the Ripper is? I skipped some stuff in this story summary, but not much. And every one of the suspects looks suspicious. They're all expert hackers and programmers. Well, except maybe for Catherine, we don't really know about that. But there are other clues that could cause you to believe any one of them could be the killer. Magnata has been hiding evidence, he's violent, his shoulder is hurt. Falconetti has an obsession with Jack the Ripper, an interest in knives, his shoulder is also hurt. Burton has all her secret dealings with the financial companies related to her secret lab, not to mention the purpose of her lab was to develop a technology that's very similar to how the Ripper kills their victims. Catherine seems the least likely since she's been in a coma this whole time, but we did learn that her brainwave activity increased whenever the Ripper killed. Maybe her coma was a result of her trying to perform effect of the remote, timer-based aspects of the kill code? In any case, everyone is just as likely, and the sad truth is that it's completely random. No matter who the Ripper actually is, the game never changes enough to give you a strong indication as to who it is for your particular playthrough, so you've just gotta guess. If you're wrong, you just try again. In my playthrough, Magnata turned out to be the Ripper. <laughs> job on him. I couldn't have done it better myself. One must look out for himself. Marfus said his weapon would destroy Whitechapel along with the Ripper. At the end, you see Jake typing up his story back in the newsroom. No resolution for any of the other characters, and, and that's it. We don't even know if Catherine came out of her coma. It's an extremely disappointing realization to come to right at the end of the game. It would have been better if they had not had multiple endings and instead gave you clearer clues as to who the killer was. Or do the thing I said where the twist was you find out John Reese davies character was the Ripper because he has the same voice. I didn't play through the game three more times to check out the variations on the ending mostly because of all the technical issues I had just trying to finish one playthrough. But I did watch a YouTube video of the other three endings, and yeah, all that changes is Jake's monologue at the end. So, bit of an anti-climax. <laughs> I gotta say, the story here is is really bad. Like, it has a lot of interesting ideas, but it goes off in all these directions, like it's trying to set up red herrings like a good mystery story does, trying to throw you off the trail of the true killer. The only problem is they ultimately don't amount to anything, because the game randomly chooses who the killer is, and doesn't change enough of the detail along the way to make it feel satisfying even when you happen to pick the right suspect at the end. When I chose Magnata and found out I was right, I had no idea why that was the right choice. The other characters are painted just as guilty. Except Except for Catherine, that one feels really weak. And if it would have been her as the Ripper on my first playthrough, I think I would have been even more confused and disappointed. So what do we have here at the end of Ripper? It's an average point-and-click adventure with overly long transition scenes, okay shooting gallery segments, and some decent puzzles. The narrative starts out as an interesting murder mystery yarn, but the multiple suspect, multiple ending structure ultimately undermines a lot of its storytelling. The game world and atmosphere is dark and moody, and I did enjoy that, but the thing that really makes this worth looking at is the entertainingly ham-fisted performances. Christopher Walken is a show stealer, but many 
Many of the other lesser known and less important characters sprinkled throughout Ripper also impressed and entertained me. Does that make it worth playing though? I, I don't think so. I mean, if you've watched this video, you've seen the highlights. There are plenty of other entertaining bits that I didn't show off fully, so if you want more, I'd say just watch a long play. Ripper is an intriguing relic of the FMV adventure fad of the 90s, and as far as the actual performances go, it's a classic. But the gameplay and structure of the thing doesn't elevate it enough to make it worth really going back to and playing. You know, as opposed to something like the Gabriel Knight games, for example. I enjoyed exploring Ripper for this video, and I probably would have enjoyed it more if the version I played hadn't kept crashing on me, but yeah, I'll let Christopher Walken sum it up for me. This guy is unfucking believable so that's it for Ripper. Thank you very much for watching. This video took a lot longer to produce than my others, thanks to the technical difficulties I talked about. But yeah, made it in the end. If you liked the video, please like, comment, and subscribe to the channel if you haven't. More weird shit like this to come in the future. I also want to thank the Dungeon Dwellers who support this channel on Patreon and through YouTube memberships. You all really help keep this channel going. I'm gonna be honest, I want to do this channel full-time someday, and YouTube is completely unreliable. So having your support support is, I think, what could eventually make that a possibility. And I've got some surprises for all of you who give me money coming in a few months. I won't say more than that right now, but yeah, keep an eye out. I need to personally thank the ones who contribute $5 or more each month. Those are the Dungeon Architects, Antichrist Alex, Benefer94, David Carr, Glenn Haven, Goats and Goblins, Half HP, High Food Court, Izzy Lexus, Joshua Ayers, Justin Darnell, Captain Ketchup, Kevin Hanley, Kyowa, Lunar Vale, Meownarchy, Nick Wolf, Nam de Guerre, Oh My God, Amba Singh, Richard Cutting, Shannon Gates, Stefano Arena, and White Light Eyes, as well as the Dungeon Connoisseurs, Adon, Alberto Amatucci, Alfred Correa, Andy Raman, Anjan01, Asuka Dranzer, Big 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 Farty Nuts, Bunzo, Chaos Arcanum, Cherm Slurm, Chiral Spiral, Crassus Zero, Crippler Jones, Dazed Clockwork, Dika Dico, Dungeon Chili, Fangro, Glitterthrope, Harvey Bodega, Hokon Boyum, Irregular Rob, J Butt Airline, Gemma, Jet Daddy, Joe Goth Ur, Joshua Weber, Leica Come Home, Liana, Macrophage, Man with Confetti, Minced Meat, Mr. Independent, Nicholas Polestar, Noel the Monkey, Old Dead Lemons, Olaf Albine, Please Keep Making Videos, Prince Goof, Rainbows 98, Resident Delta, Rez, Ribbon Black, Robert Brandon, Roland, Sable, Samuel Pandiangan, Samurai 85X, Shark King, Sisrin, Slowbro 96, Sly Cat, Solar, Spody, T, TCB, True Axiom, Tuesday Twin, TV's Brent, Warrior Song, Where Am I, Help, and Zach Diedrich. Thank you all for your support, and once again, thank you for watching. I'll catch you in the next one. Until then, Ripper, check it out. Dungeon Chill, out.